Hey there, film fans. I'm Jeff. I'm Dave. And I'm John, and welcome back to The Love of Cinema, a pod in which we'll challenge one another to discuss movies, both new and old, with a strictly positive critical eye. That's right. And to avoid lazy negativity, we've decided to make this a drinking game. A what? Oh, no, I'm unprepared. A drinking game of sorts. Uh... So anytime we say anything negative about the film, about each other, we're going to go ahead and hear this sound. That sound means that we have to take a drink and we hope you drink along with us. So, pour yourselves a glass. We're going to talk about a movie that's the best positive spit on Stockholm Syndrome since Katie and Tom. <laughs> yeah, it I was is waiting for that. Very, yep. Somebody, I was like, who's going to... First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm... Where is it? <laughs> the first Stockholm Syndrome joke of the episode goes to David. <laughs> that's right, people. We are... Yeah, chase it. <laughs> we are talking about V for Vendetta today. Why? Well, the random year generator set up by our editor and producer, Dave Green, over here. Uh, engineer, DP, <sighs> extraordinaire, has spun the year 2005 when we went through a list of films and we decided to give V for Vendetta a look. We also have a knack for picking movies that are about to leave Netflix so that if you're yeah, listening dude. to this in the future... <laughs> it's it's also on Max, so... Is it really? Yeah. Oh, okay, I didn't know cool. that. Okay, cool. So if you, oh, have well, Netflix, if you have Netflix with ads, watch it on Max. Okay. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. I was, I'm, I'm very curious. My setup, definitely, I'm going to ask you guys, is like, what is it about? Because we all, we've all we all seen V. Everybody's seen V. And what is it about this rewatch? Like, did you have something in mind ahead of time? You know, in the other movies, we're kind of like, let's just give it a rewatch. I'm, I want to know if there was something that you were thinking about ahead of time. I think I said what mine was last week. But that's I'm going to prompt it when we get to the segment for V in a little bit. But first, we have to go through our sponsors, do a little gripes, maybe a mini review or something, and then finish up the episode with what you've been watching in a teaser for next week. That's the format. We keep it positive. We drink a lot. John, you want to want to shout our sponsors out to help us? Uh, get sure. Going? We have some sponsors. Uh, we have a beer sponsor. His name is Carlos Barozo. You can find his uh, link to his Instagram handle in the show notes at cbarozo.beer. We also have an artist in residence who provides every bit of music for this episode and every single episode. His name is Dasein, D-A-S-E-I-N. You can find their link in the show notes and link tree as well. Go like, love, subscribe, download, stream, all the things. They're on the usual uh, music platforms. What do you guys nice. think? What are yeah. you feeling? You got something up your up your sleeve, gripey wise? You upset about something this week, or <laughs> or what? I don't know what if Dave did a mini review or a gripe of Madam Web last week. It was somewhere in between. It was somewhere in the gray zone. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was definitely buzzed as shit and like toasted after that it, review. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that did was you guys a, watch that was the a review. Sag Awards. I watched the Sag Awards every second of it. Yeah, yeah, Sag yeah. Awards yeah. on TV. It, uh... Uh, they're on uh, Netflix. Not really. <laughs> they're yes, on. They're, they're on, on Netflix. Netflix, Dave. I don't know if uh, your version. Dave, you can watch them it, again. But... Yeah. Uh, we watched every Idris second. Elba. Of it. Idris Elba. Idris Elba as the host. Yeah. There were there were there were several segments in this show where I kind of wondered who wrote this. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, oh, this is a. I don't know if every bit landed, but mm. of course it was great seeing all the. <laughs> sure. It was great seeing everybody in the room. Uh, that's a really cool theater. Uh, I guess it was extra emotional. Let's just call it out what they all talked about. But like, that's really cool that they got to all be together and support each other and slap each other on the back after a tough last year yeah. with all the strikes mm. and everything. So did, congrats did, uh, to SAG after a Did everybody see Robert Downey Jr.'s acceptance speech? It was a weird one. It was not I, his I, best yeah, speech. Not, um, I, I liked it. I, I was like, well, I only saw the clip where he was like, uh, the thing I have over all the other applicants is nobody appreciates the center own voice more than me. Like oh, that's the only yeah. piece yeah. I saw, and I was like, "Yeah, that's that's." It was a- kind of funny. One thing I'm being very technical here, and I I feel this way about all the word shows. So I'm sorry, folks, but I think if you understand what I mean, and people who are technical will understand why this is important. In live event television, especially award shows, where you have a lot of jokes and people trying to create a little levity in their speeches. If you don't mix up the audience's reaction, yes, and it sounds yeah. like nobody is laughing. Or if you don't have microphones there in the first place, every joke feels like it falls dead yep. to the audience at home. And that was yeah. what happened for I me, at least, more. with the Netflix mix. I don't know if there weren't mics in there. I know they I know they can't put mics in that particular space. I just don't know if they did or chose not to, or if they just mixed them down, or if somebody just forgot to push the fucking level up, because it sounded like fucking crickets, no matter yeah. what was happening. I agree. Mm. It and, was weird and, and awkward. And sports are crushing all other live programming. I also, oh, I, I have a gripe. I, I forgot I had a gripe, but um, it's cr- sports are crushing all other live programs. It's not yet, Dave. Uh, all yeah. other live programming right now. And you know what? And you know what they're so good at? 
the sound they, uh, they literally have the, yeah, so yeah. many people just walking around with those big fucking weird globe looking things like they're yeah, calling you, the aliens you can hear the quarterback telling the coach to get fucked from and, like 60 feet away it's great and at the same time you can hear section 235 fucking erupt in an applause or whatever like they do a good job of hyping I don't know what up that is, the but, audience yeah. <laughs> Dave, that, you've, you've sat near there with me, Dave. Oh, okay. Anyway, cool. anyway, no, I, I, that's what that is. I, uh, I completely, I completely agree. I'm ready for my. Oh crush. my god, you guys! Wait, we what have to. Ha- I have to ask you: Was the Breaking Bad bit for real? Was that sincere? Did Bob Odenkirk go off script and fuck them all up? I don't know, but that's the good shit about live TV. Who knows? Who knows if that was god, real or not? I haven't funny. seen that bit. In stands for no fucking way. I'm saying that cheesy line. That's what he. <laughs> <laughs> but he did it just, well. Like, He's good from there. He's oh, and good. Meryl. I think Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep acted. She gave a master class in acting at the top of that show. Do you, when, do you remember that, Jeff? She pretends to fall. She and grabbed the mic. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. I thought it was fucking for real. And then here come two co-stars from Devil Wears Prada carrying her glasses. And there's no glasses. way that was yeah. planned. Yeah. Un- unbelievable. God, unbelievable. They've been doing, they've been doing that for years. In a Pratt ball. Oh, God. But Meryl did it this time. It was yeah. unreal. She was so good. It was so good. I mean, she was in on the last one, too, when they did the, like, the two of them were on stage and she was in the audience. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, okay. I don't think yeah. I remember that. Uh, they're, they're trying to make jokes with her and she's just glaring at them. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. All right. Maybe they were playing off of that and I missed it. Was that in the Golden Globes or something? I just missed no, it. No, I think it was the Oscars a couple of years ago. Okay. This, was, okay. this was good. Okay. This, that, this, it was really good. I agree. Um, Fuck, and then the way they cut to the backstage thing, you know, it was, it was for a first time go. It was, it was, it was good. I definitely like being movie. able to rewind it. Like, I'm glad it's on streaming. I'm glad we can rewatch. I rewatched because I missed the beginning. It was so mm. easy to go back. I didn't have yeah, to worry until good. it airs the next day and on your streaming network. Yeah. Like, so fucking annoying. I was really convenient. Yeah. Oh, some speech, and that's some speeches what, were that's what we used to. We used to do that with the Oscars in Australia because, like, we were sleeping pretty much or, like, at work yeah, or whatever what happens. And we used to have uh, Oscars drinking game party at my house. So we'd DVR the damn thing. Everyone was under instructions you? not to no. watch it. <laughs> and then you would literally, we, they'd announce the nominees. You'd pick your one. And yeah, it was, uh, then if you didn't get it right, you drink. And oh, that sounds yeah, like a there, there are some years was I can't this? tell you what, spe- what best picture was. Oh, oh, oh my sure. God. Was uh, this? I had to remember yeah. later. Yeah. Was this Netflix's first live event? No, no, no. They, hmm. they've done other reality shows have been live, like um, and, and okay. they've done a couple of their live things, and they've been trying to get into sports, but yeah, they, they've done a couple, not many, but they've done they've done other live shows, yeah. Okay, well, that's I've, cool. Congrats to Succession, and-, and there were some really moving parts. Oh, you know, Succession has never, they've never, they will never win, they've never won an individual award at the SAGs. Because they won a bunch of Emmys this year. Jeremy Strong won Best Actor. Matthew McFadden at the Emmys has won at least two. Um, Sarah Snook won. Kieran Culkin won. But they have ne- they won two ensemble, but they've never won. And then this year, of course, um, uh, Elizabeth uh-huh. Debicki won for The Crown, which was amazing. She was so good as Princess Diana. So sorry, Snooky. And um, and then uh, Pedro Pascal <laughs> won for The like Last of Us, and he was sorry. genuinely drunk. No, I. I <laughs> anyway. Um, it was, there were some moving speeches though. There was, there was, it was moving. I'm excited for the Oscars, even though we are we already know Me who's going to win now. We we know who's going to win the Oscar, and that that always kind of sucks. Um, everybody's done a clean sweep so far in their respective acting category, so they're going to win the Oscar. But um, mm. but I'm I still it was very moving. I was excited. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I I know what you mean, but I'm still I'm still pumped. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. All right, I'm ready. Oscars. Any other gripes? Do you guys have any other mini reviews? I don't have a gripe or a review. Nothing. Nothing for me this week. All right, John. You ready? No, no. ready to right. rack. Yeah, actually. actually no, yeah, no, no, no. Let's. I'll talk about it at the end. Go for okay, it. Okay, go ahead. I'm so go ahead. Fu- an- go ahead. <laughs> enough. Enough with the dumb competition shows. It is nothing says we had a writer's strike and an actor strike last year more than a new competition show that sucks worse than all the other shows that is produced <laughs> with more money than any fucking scripted television show should ever get. I, I, there was a show that I watched this week, and I'm so sorry, she knows, but Angela, we were you watching it. it. It's called Can You See My Voice? Can you see my voice? And to this, it was twins. So there were these two twins and they were with Joel McHale, who was the host. And they always get these good hosts, fucking right? You have Joel like McHale. fucking Alan Cumming is a host of one of these shows. They always pay these people too much fucking yeah. money. He's, and he's two sets of twins will come out. Up. Two sets of twins will come out. One was lip syncing and one wasn't. You have to guess which one was lip syncing. And the fun thing is that the gag is like, 
if you think they were lip syncing, they have to sing live. So if they were good, people go, oh, they're actually good. And if they're bad, they sing the song bad and everybody laughs and goes, oh, oh, oh they're actually bad. <laughs> That's a show. That's a full show. That's not a YouTube video. It's not a clip. That is a full show. And there was more money in that than American Idol ever got. I couldn't believe how good it looked. And I was like, this is such a fucking waste of our industry, our humanity, our network programming. <laughs> NBC, CBS, they should be fucking ashamed of themselves. I can't believe this is where we are right now. Stop with the AI video, the text to video. What is that called that I texted you guys today? Stop with this bullshit. Uh, you all suck. We fucking hate all of you. Just give us our shows. Give us our shows back. Yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. Well said. <laughs> Meanwhile, the only well thing I said. watched, I watched a docu-series this week, so there goes me. But uh, I, uh, word I, on the I, street I did, is... I did know someone that worked uh, for an agency and they the agency blew up because they were hiring all these people for reality TV and all those game shows and stuff. And it was that agency's job to provide these people and then yep. uh soon the, it was like the week after the, the strike was announced is over that agency is almost out of business they're laying people mm. off left right and center because they're just canceling everything yeah it wasn't it wasn't for, it could have been worse is. it wasn't for it <laughs> sora is the name of the text of video which is still sora, a ways away and it takes a ton of processing power but apparently um um certain people are really like scared of of investing in new studios and stuff because they're worried AI is going to make them obsolete before they can pay back their investment. Dude, fucking, shit. not to rewind, but fucking Fran Drescher's oh, yeah. speech when it got weird about talking about AI and she was like threatening AI, the cutaways, it cut to John Lithgow and he was like, what the fuck is this woman <laughs> talking about? Yeah, it was, Dude, was it Tyler she, Perry it was canceled scary. the $90 billion studio? Ty yeah, 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 Tyler Perry. After seeing what the story, he, yeah. he, he, he canceled it. He was going to do a massive expansion of his studio and canceled it because he can just do that with AI now. Which you can. The processing yeah, power is might, way too much. You might be but, jumping the gun a bit, but. Yeah, you, you can't know. do that yet. But yeah. I guess it, you know, it was going to take you decades to pay off $800 million uh, while mm. reinvesting into new programming and stuff. But anyway, I, I don't know. It's that's. Just thought I'd throw that into my gripe, but yeah. Also, they, they messed God up the timing. Damn. So you had Barbara Streisand gave this amazing, long, emotional, I thought it was really well done speech. And then Fran Drescher talked kind of right after that. There was like one award in between with no commercials. And so all of a sudden it was like another kind of long, want to be emotional speech and i was kind of already losing steam so unfortunately the programming of that was a little too bad but uh john lithgow got yeah, a lot of cutaways we can't keep talking about the segment he people did, here for v for vendetta but he got so many he was very emotional during one of the speeches and um i mean if they're here for v vendetta they hit skip about five minutes ago yeah, yeah. check the timestamp, folks you'll know when we actually get there okay anything else you uh knuckleheads want to talk about no, I'm excited to hear about the year 2005. All mm. right, we're going to talk about V for Vendetta, starring V the Unburnt, here in a second. <laughs> uh, first, he's very burnt. Actually. Let's give you. Oh yeah, yeah, he's really fucking burnt. Let's go Just into Undead, the film year 2005. I'll give you some historical context as well, then we'll talk about V. Guys, 2005. What was the highest grossing movie that came out in 2005? And there were two movies that were pretty close. So I, I kind of, I'll give you like partial credit, but. One was victorious, according to boxofficemojo.com. I'm going to go with... Dave, do you have a guess before me? Episode, you know? th episode three. John? Episode three? Star Wars is that episode the, is that three? Re Revenge Star Wars. of the Sith, yes. Yeah, episode three. We, 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 oh. talk, we talked about it as a summer blockbuster. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, it's got to be that or King Kong? Uh, King Kong comes in at number six with $550 million worldwide. no. Damn. Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith was actually the second highest grossing movie of the year. Damn it, the first time I actually have a guess. <laughs> Number one, Harry Potter and the Goblet of oh, sure. Fire. Oh, yeah. Those things. Yeah. Which tends to and find not its Batman way. Batman Begins, not Tends Fantastic to find its way. Four. Nope. Goblet of Fire tends to find its way into a lot of people's top two or three. You know, that third and fourth, you know, that, that chunk right there, that transitional chunk. Mm. That's the fourth Before they one, all right? go through puberty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. the games with schools yeah. Yeah. get invited. That's 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 where yeah. it stopped becoming a movie uh, movie series for yeah. kids. How obvious is it that's that true. those games were fucking? <laughs> when they kill a kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how, yeah. It's like, oh, how, he did. <laughs> how horrible! It, and they point this out on social media all the time. Those games, these kids, they move to Hogwarts for a year, and apparently the school is totally fine, just tripling in size once every seven years. But these, they they're there the entire year for three days for the three events and two of the events they can't even fucking see 
There's one event totally that entirely underwater. takes place in a maze and there are no cameras. And then there's another one that's entirely underwater. So these kids, and then the dragon one, you can't really see the dragons because they're like under rocks and shit. And I don't want to see the dragon because the ever, fire is real. Like even, it would, even, the whole year they're there. Even the best part of the snitch competitions are snitch Quidditch. Mm. You know, the best Quidditch. part of the Quidditch competitions are out of view. They're in the yeah. too high in the clouds or way out of. Harry the, caught arena. the snitch. He did. Fuck. Like what if sure. I went to what if I went sure. to an NFL game and then they were like somebody scored thirty points in the locker room and it's like all right and then we just go home. What a god yeah. fucking total plot it's holes in us. these movies and man there are people that still god god i still though still just hearing you talk about it i haven't watched those movies in a few years just hearing you talk that. about it i kind of want to go home and go watch it right now yeah, yeah the music <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, the really genre. Just watch it. well we're getting the new ones soon was it 2026 we're getting the new is that, ones is that really fucking what? happening is that it's, just straight is. to amazon movies um, or no shows give me 3d or? tv give me vi- apple vision no it's uh it's max is doing it i think yeah, it is Warner. Yeah, because yeah, they, they had the, yeah. the Warner the first time. Um, yeah. And it's <laughs> it's going to be apparently a more book like adaptation. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, we'll we'll go, we we'll go about into- this in our we bitched about this in our Corona franchise face off, but all that means is that you're going to see the elf boycotting. That's it. That's it. Hermione. Elf rights. Yes. Elf, elf rights. Fucking, elf rights. Yeah. Elf rights. <laughs> also, the first three. The you first know, it's two about time. You know what's hilarious too? Wait, hold on. We're going to gripe about this. The The first book is like <laughs> fucking pure. It was like true to the book. None of that, that book is, exactly is not in the, the movie. Yeah. And people's yeah, number yeah. one complaint about even, that movie is that it was like too much like the book. They didn't add any <laughs> spice to it. It was like, it's almost even boring. Too, it's just obviously. Chamber, and Chamber's honestly, great. I, mean, I like I, Chamber. I was making a joke about it, but I really don't think the only real plot that subplot that isn't in those movies is the fucking elf rights revolution yeah. that she tries to lead yeah. which like we still don't spend time with any fucking raven claws come don't, on don't get nobody in there with the, the fucking at, puffs nobody wants to look at 30 fucking dobbies it's like nobody yeah. wants to watch <laughs> that nobody come on cute oh character when it stands alone and it's still a bunch the of children of dobby it's still oh. a bunch of children at the end that have to take on um um the the axis powers anyway okay so the number three highest grossing movie of this year is the chronicles of narnia the lion the witch and the wardrobe at 720 million dollars uh, worldwide war of the worlds comes in at number four madagascar number five <laughs> king kong six nice. mr mrs smith number seven there we go action comedy they just came into an amazon series recently after about 15 years of them saying they were going to do it the johnny depp Tim Burton, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with Helena Bottom Carter, of course. And Anne everyone Hathaway out. comes in at number eight. Hitch comes in at number nine with $366 <laughs> billion. Dollars. And guess what? Batman Begins sneaks its way in there at $356 uh, million. Dollars. Uh, Revenge, Revenge of the Sith had the highest day ever domestically at $50 million, topping Spider-Man 2's $40 million. And wow. Wiki- Wikipedia says Emmanuel Levy... Talked about 2005 uh, about sexual diversity because he had broke back and then crash and then there's films about racism and Syriani, uh, Syriana and geopolitical drama thrillers and such. Anyway, that was on Wikipedia. That I did my research really well. Anyway, um, the AFI top ten from this year also included in, films like go, The Squid and the Whale. At? I'm going to go and edit Wikipedia one week and have you saying some outlandish shit. Good night and good luck comes in there. A history of violence. King Kong. Munich is a fantastic film from this year that I think gets overlooked. Stephen Tony Kushner. Let's go. But also yeah, their first the, guys. The forty year old virgin made the AFI Damn, top crashers. ten list. Well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, they made the AFI list. That's right. Oscars really quick. Ang Lee won for everything for d- directing, but uh, also won the Oscar for Brokeback Mountain. Philip Seymour Hoffman did a clean sweep for Capote, uh, but Joaquin. Um, Joaquin won the Golden Globe for music. And then he sits there and goes, how many people are surprised they won a Golden Globe for comedy or music? Uh, Joaquin Phoenix, what a guy. He's awesome. Clooney beats Jake Gyllenhaal and Paul Giamatti. Shout out Paul Giamatti to take home an acting Oscar that I think a lot of people forget for Syriana. And Rachel Weisz does a clean sweep, almost a clean sweep, uh, beating out Amy Adams and Junebug, Michelle Williams for Brokeback Mountain, and Tandy Newton for Crash. Yada, yada, yada. Broke back and crash. Won some writing awards. While Wallace and Gromit won Best Animated. A little stop motion out there. Wait, sorry. And what did Rachel win for? Rachel Weiss won for Constant Gardener. And, um, oh, yeah. Good mm. And we can never Maybe. forget, this is also yeah. the year that 3-6 Mafia won an Oscar for It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp. And a couple other things that were going on in the world before you guys do whatever you want to do. <laughs> on Valentine's Day, 2005, <laughs> A group of college students launch a video platform service named oh, Jesus. YouTube. 
Wow, fuck comes out yeah. Valentine's wow. Day, Holy February shit. 2005. I don't uh, think 2000, it's that young. 2005 becomes the Atlantic's the Atlantic hurricane season's most active season on record with 22 named storms. Of course, the most famous of which is Hurricane Katrina. The Hurricane Katrina was not the one with the strongest winds, but it was obviously the most damaging and devastating for sure. And the George Bush administration did not help that. The NHL lockout happened this year. A second photo of the Hubble Space Telescope from the Hubble Space Telescope confirms that Pluto had two additional moons, Nix and Hydra. And guess Pluto what? Is still a planet, it means it's a fucking you. planet, people. <laughs> in my home state, in my home state, King Daka opens at Six Flags Great Adventure, becoming the tallest, <laughs> fastest roller coaster in the world. 450 oh, feet wanna, high. I ride it. 450 feet tall, 122 miles an hour. The whole ride lasts about 27 seconds. I've read it many times. And, and a month later, awesome. some crazy Damn. motherfuckers built a bigger one. No, no, they didn't. Yeah. It's still, it was years, 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 years. <laughs> um, Vanity Fair revealed that Mark Felt was Deep Throat. Deep Throat's identity was unveiled. And the Deep Impact spacecraft, <laughs> and yes, an actual spacecraft that was named after a movie, collided with a comet. Why would you pick on, that movie? <laughs> on 4th of July, which is great. Tom and Jerry aired its final episode. Oh, awful, and then really quick, in po- geopolitics, we talked about Saddam Hussein went on trial. There were bloody Hong Kong protests for democracy against China. Egypt's first ever presidential elections. Paris riots after the death of two Muslims. Pope John Paul II dies. That's politics, especially in this movie. <laughs> and Iraq and Afghanistan wars leads to a ton of bombings all over the world, including in Iran, Jordan, and Bangladesh. Anything you guys want to talk about from the film year 2005? Any other shout outs? No, yeah, I'm ready to go. some shout outs. I know Dave's ready, but I'll shout out just a few. Man of the House. Uh, Terrence Malick's The New World. Ah. Um, I thought that movie is quite beautiful. First time he worked with Chivo. Hmm. Uh, so that was kind of the beginning of their giant collaboration together. Um, Lords of Dogtown is a ah, sweet cool. like indie film. Heath Ledger had three movies come out this year. Brothers Grimm, Lords of Dogtown, mm. and Brokeback. Mm. And, mm. Uh, and he was... Batman Begins came out, so you also kind of think of him as like first maybe being noticed through this work that he was being so prolific with at the time that would carry him a few years later into Dark Knight. That's exciting. Ron Howard's Cinderella Man. And um, I think we, I think you may have mentioned it, but Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is a fun. Yeah. That's kind of, that's we a, can that's kind a of favorite to go back to. As, it's a favorite. It, it's, we don't see a lot of Shane Black directed films, but it's also, I think, some film historians will use that term lightly might cite that is robert downey jr's return as a leading man yeah. and robert downey jr cites that movie as the first time that he really felt like he had become a more masculine alpha leading man because he had started studying martial arts in between his kind of like hiatus like ar- around that time and this is the first movie where he was back and he started kicking ass and this eventually led to it's hard to imagine a world where he wasn't like the highest paid actor of all time, you know? Um, (laughs) Anyway, yeah. Memoirs of a Geisha. That movie's pretty good. Uh, Jarhead. Jarhead, yeah. uh, Mendez and our boy Roger Deakins together uh, making something beautiful. And yeah, anyway, that's probably enough. Anyway, good stuff. You didn't want to mention uh, The Ballad of Jack and Rose or Be Cool or Fever Pitch. All right, whatever. Let's... Mention them all. Ballad of Jack and Rose. Holy shit, that movie's good. All right. What do you think, Dave? Time to move on? Time to move on. Let's do it. V for Vendetta 2005. This is, of course, written by the Wachowskis right after their Matrix series. Um, it was obviously billed as the Wachowski brothers. They are now the Wachowskis. As co-written by David Lloyd, who was the, of course, graphic novelist. This famous, famous, famous graphic novel. James McTeague was the director. And yes, I did look up how to say his name properly. <laughs> Me too. I haven't seen a lot of James McTeague <laughs> yeah, yeah. movies. This, of course, starts Hugo Weaving, and it got a lot of press ahead of time because Natalie Portman had to shave her head for this movie, and this was back with Superstar. So a year out, everybody's like, "What is this movie that she shaved her head for?" V for Dead. Oh my God, the famous graphic novel. So a year out, I already had all the free press from that. It was nominated for not much. Oh, it got more press than that because they had a, a surprise role change as well. Which role was that? The, oh, really? the, uh, the original V was um, James Purefoy. And oh. he bailed after three weeks of filming due to they they started creative differences, but James McTeague said he couldn't reconcile the mask, like he couldn't like the mask 
I don't know whether he didn't want to have the mask or what, but basically he didn't want to do it. He bailed. And so they were left without a V and then they got, uh, you know, they called agent Smith. Yeah. They called agent Smith up, brought him in. Um, said, but, we know a little, guy. but there was a little bit of uh bitterness going around at the time because there's some people were saying, well, they shot, you know, three weeks of this movie. Did they just use that guy? And they, no one would answer the question about whether or not he just dubbed over his voice and they used his performance in the film, but he's not credited at all. Mm. And so they were, the, the news had a field day with that. Well, no, pre- yeah. uh, no, there is press that's bad press for sure, but that seemed like probably good it, press yeah. for them. It, well, I mean, was, talking. give you an idea of how effective it is. No one remembers it. The, the yeah. press of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like, Dave, you got to make sure. this. That's why you're on task here. You gotta, you know, people can't forget. Uh, I'm gonna give you. The, I'm gonna give you the pitch. We, we I think we kind of know what it's about, everybody. But there were some 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 gaps that I had in a future British dystopian society. Future is definitely seeming very past now. But in a future British dystopian society, <laughs> That's a disturbing parallel. A, sh- a shadowy freedom fighter known only by the alias of V plots to overthrow the tyrannical government with the help of a young woman. Now I want to go back to my prompt at the beginning. This movie has a 62 meta score. The IMDb, it's like uh, 8.2, so that's pretty high, I guess. What, I for me, I, I said this last week, I was curious to know why this movie isn't as cool as it could have been. I, I feel like this could have been like a Fight Club thing. Like They clearly wanted it to be a cool movie when they made it. They wanted this, they got British like royalty actors, like your mm. deep cuts, your Stephen Ray. They got Stephen Fry, all the Stevens. They got Hugo, obviously, and then of oh, course, England only has Stevens, no one else. Natalie Portman. No really, everybody was like, "How's her accent going to be?" You got Ben Miles, who's a big RSC guy in here. Like you've this got month's, John Hurt, this month's prime fucking, minister is Stephen something. You've got the fucking Elephant Man <laughs> as the corrupted, like afraid of everybody, lives in a fucking bunker Chancellor. You've got Sinead Cusack as a doctor. You've got British acting <clears throat> legends and royalty. And this movie just never was... Fight Club's a terrible example because it's not even close. For some reason, it was cool, but never that. I really wanted to rewatch it. Just, just That was front of mind for me. Was there anything front of mind for you guys watching this movie? What was something that was on your mind going into it? David. I, I think a lot of people switch off the second they see the DC logo because um, this is a DC Vertigo Comics yes, it adaptation. Is. Um, but going into this, I was like, cool, I can't remember to see again what happens because th- there are two movies that I can never remember what happens in. This is one of them. And the other one is um, event horizon. I can never remember how that fucking ends. I think I just block it out, but you, you know how this ends though. I feel like the ending of this. I remember oh, yeah. very clearly. Yeah. It's everything that happens in the middle. Yeah. I like, cause there's so much more They're like the, the Stockholm syndrome joke I made at the beginning. There's so much more than that happens yeah. in this movie. And uh, yeah. Cause it, it's like, Two hours and that the the section where she's spending time with him is only what forty minutes of the movie tops. Yep, I want to say, John, is there anything that you were curious about? Did you go in with any intention? I have not seen that since it came out, so I guess I was also like excited to watch, um, kind of a fresh take on what yes is a graphic novel from a comic book you know world at a time when we're probably on the way out of it, which I'm excited about, but we still like have a lot of like memories of what it felt like to be in a zeitgeist where it's dominated by comic books. But this one is unique, obviously, because it's a standalone graphic novel. It's not a serialized, nobody has, maybe somebody has, but nobody has actually greenlit and put something on the air that is a new serialized version of what happens to Natalie after this movie and what mm-hmm. happens to, you know, like they fucking do with everything else, comic books. Oh my God. A, so, a posse would hunt them down if they tried. I get, yeah, <laughs> man. I mean, this is a, so it was, I was excited to watch a standalone. Um, and also I, like you, Dave, I, I genuinely just could not remember what led up to the explosion of parliament. I remembered, uh, remember, remember the 5th of December. I remembered how it's, kind of started and I remembered how it ended. And I really, mm. I really did not recall that there was a year in between. I totally yeah. forgot that about the plot it's point. Yeah, November, by the way. I, surprised I was like, oh yeah, right. The- officially okay. known as Guy Fawkes. And like night. you, Jeff. Yeah. And like you, Jeff, I, this movie did get kind of like that cult excitement around it. And there were a lot of people like you who had like posters in their apartment and stuff like this did get some kind of following, but why doesn't it 
it hasn't really gone down with having the same kind of uh, legacy dramatically as some of the more um, the grittier stories like mm-hmm. like Fight Club or um, Requiem for a Dream or some things that have like these like kind of culty followings from the late 90s, early 2000s. And rewatching it again, I think I understand why. Um, but I still really, I really mm-hmm. enjoyed watching it. I'm excited I to mean, talk about it. I mean, it's the dialogue. The dialogue is so thick you can take a swim in it. Like, it's if yeah, alliter- go ahead, yeah, yeah, dude, alliterate, there, dude. alliteration lovers rejoice on the, on this because like there's a whole paragraph of alliteration that just happens. Yeah. Um, also, but, yeah, speak- speaking really quick of Guy Fox, um, there is a series called Gunpowder on Max. If you're curious hmm. about this, about that revolution, which stars Kit Harrington and Liv Tyler. Oh shit! Um, which is about was him. He he actually plays Robert Catesby. Um, but it's he leads Guy Fox, a group of English Catholic traitors. They plan to blow up a palace of Westminster and kill James the First, the King, in the infamous gunpowder plot. So there is, you know, if you're if you're curious about it and you don't feel like reading mm. a book, you know, that's on Max. And he got his he got his own <laughs> celebration night in Australia. It was known as Cracker Night until <laughs> uh, it, until they cancelled it because too many people blew their fingers off. Uh, yep. Oh my god, dude! Yeah, so we went, they went full. Dude, they went full. Jason had, Pierre Paul and all the Australia. way, all the way through my childhood. We had Kraken night, and then like about I want to say mid eighties, they were like, "Yeah, no more Kraken night." And I'm like, "Well, fuck! I like me crackers, but yeah, <laughs> you like it was so it was so <laughs> funny because you ever seen those spinning wheel ones that you nail it to a fence and you light it and it just spins and makes a fan? Well, I had one of those jumped off the nail and it chased my fucking auntie up the yard. Like when she zigged, it zigged. <laughs> when she zagged, it zagged. It, it, it's, you couldn't the credit. The cracker chased your auntie. It was rolling up the fucking yard. She's running screaming. <laughs> it's amazing. Oh my it's not God. a dog off a leash. I mean, <laughs> oh God. So okay. yeah, Cracker Night was fun. All right, so we <laughs> already watched this. <laughs> We well, already watched it. What was yeah, the yes. last? So I'm, I'm a jo- the last time I watched it was in college. I think it was 2009. When and so that was my second time. So this is now my third time rewatching. I've not seen it again in 15 years. What about you, Dave? When was the last time you saw this? Um, I would say it's about yeah, maybe 10 years ago. Interesting, right? Is yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've seen it about I've seen it about three or four times. Um, but again, it's it's one of those ones that kind of leaves you. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because I don't like what happens in the middle. Okay, some things definitely <laughs> stayed with me. I will say, I, I, when I, these things came back, I was like, "Oh yeah," because I remember at first I was like, "Oh right, the whole thing takes place in a day, mm. right?" And then I was like, "Oh wait," but she goes, "Yeah." And then like, but I remember the letters, and it, I remember the that he had already killed her and stuff. Anyway, um, what do you guys think of this rewatch? I felt like David sounds like you did not <laughs> care for <laughs> care for at least a large chunk of this movie. No, I loved it. Oh, I okay. thought it was great. I, emotionally, huh. I don't like what happens in the middle. Oh, I see. But all the performances are on track, and it's it's made so well. There's some fantastic action sequences. If you you know to help boost up the the graphic novel adaptation side, and of course that's part of the story. Um, but yeah, no, I love this. Like Natalie Portman's brilliant in this. She is really, really, really good in this. You know what's you know what I makes it so important. brilliant? I fucking noticed because um, I. I watch people speak a lot because I, I, you know, have a gig as a sound tech. So you watch people sing and how their mouth moves and stuff like that. And different accents move differently. I've noticed this over years and years of doing it. And her mouth, she actually trained her mouth to move like a British person talking. And I noticed Ooh. it during the film. And I'm like, holy fuck. Like the, the shape of her mouth has changed how she normally speaks in an American accent. I was like, that's some next yeah. level shit. Makes sense. We use our articulators differently. Yeah. Definitely helps to yeah yeah to do that. She is a uh, she's gorgeous in this movie as as a performer as an actor. Her craft. Um, I had I had such a big crush on her when when I was a kid <laughs> with Padme uh, and yeah. fucking Star Wars. So this is like right in the pocket where I was just I was just gonna watch anything she was in. Uh, I think it's important to remind people that this kind of movie because of like. Batman Begins came out this year, folks. Like, that is hard to imagine. If you were somebody who really came of age and watched a lot of movies after this p- period of time, Christopher Nolan changed everything with a superhero movie this year. And I still don't think people think of V as a superhero movie. But we just no. hadn't seen a lot, I mean, unless it, you were yeah. going in for genre films, you know, and you watched 
Blade and you watched the X-Men movies were fucking awesome. And two of those had already come out by this point. Um, this I mean, kind of movie just didn't seem to niche. be taken. It is niche and it just, but it, it, I remember when they presented this movie because of all the violence, it was rated R. Was it rated R at the time? I, think I remember so. just thinking that it took itself more seriously than some of the other like genre films. And right. there was, you know, just the politics that are around it. It's rated R, yeah. Um, I think I think I guess for me the looking back maybe one reason that it doesn't quite go beyond being a genre film is because it is so plot driven as good as Natalie Portman is um and there's that sequence in the middle that everyone might use as an argument against what I'm saying that you get to watch her really be imprisoned and go through all this torture and stuff, but it's mostly action. Like it's mostly, most of the people speak in declarative observations or declarative, you know, sentences about what they're going to do or what they feel about what was just said to them. And I think that ultimately because of the quick cutting and that stuff, it does, it sits in that world. Like it is a really good, strong stylistic adaptation of a graphic novel. Yeah. Hmm. The one, the one to, time it's not plot driven is when she's in with the priest and she suddenly decides to not go along with this and warn him and plot, though. escape. No, Maybe it's it's, it's a it's a decision made by the character that wasn't expected. And the, I think the reason it's not expected is because you're on this lovely little like plot driven excursion and then all of a sudden a character decision is made where she just changes up the plot like, and decides to she wants to escape. She wants out. She redirects the plot. Maybe. Anyway, yeah, but okay. Yeah. So that scene, expect, by the yeah. way, so there were definitely some things that I missed or I forgot. I definitely remember when Natalie Portman turns around in the priest's office. I definitely remember seeing that as a young man, uh, for sure. But um, <laughs> but that whole priest sequence and had the fact that he was the highest paid pers- person at Lark Hill. Yeah. It's like, he's a priest. Oh, yeah? Why is he being paid $200,000? And it's like, oh, and the pharmacology and all this stuff. I mean, that kind of stuff. I was like, oh, I'm getting more and more out of this this time. So maybe it's not cool because it's almost like the more I ga- the gather, the more I gain. It's not... I don't know. I, I I I like this more now, but I almost liked it more because of how the plot is so solid and how truthful it is. It just ages well. It, it is, but it, there it aren't did. as many. It is. It's not like I'm like, yeah, let's blow up Parliament. I am sitting there. I'm just like, wow, this is really well done. You know? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I, I don't want that to sound like a, a criticism by any means. Like for a genre film to handle political unrest so well is is pretty remarkable it doesn't feel you feel your jaw is kind of open by the end of this movie that mm. they actually pulled off in a movie blowing up fucking house of parliament with a satirical point of view that is very much that the there is a almost a satirical spin on it because of the music but the lines underneath it he is you he is me he is my mom he's my dad he's all of us and then just seeing all the v's and everyone in the movie, every character who's been in the movie is revealed very quickly in these quick cuts, removing the V mask. There's something very serious about it. And it's, I don't know, it's set in this futuristic dystopian time that is not far enough away and is not so unbelievable that it feels like it's lacking a sense of reality. Yeah. Is you could, yeah. you somebody could say that William Hurt, William Hurt, John Hurt. I always forget John Hurt. John Hurt. John Hurt. Some people could say that he's too Hitler screamy for it to feel real. What a gig, too. Know. Just if come you in, lived through come in 2016 and... to 2020, yeah. you could probably believe that somebody <laughs> would be that pure, pure fucking evil and just have that much desire to so scream behind the scenes. No, he's, not scre- he's not screaming over a TV. He's screaming to his cabinet. So, but of course, what, he'd be But what a gig, curious. though, for, for him to come in and just sit down and deliver all his lines to this camera and then fuck off. That's great. Like, and he nailed it. Can I just say, I just The saw- only thing I think, and I'm being honest here, the only thing that, the only criticism that I think I had that I thought was a little bit of a cheap shot, just because it was so, rel- it was such an easy parallel to Nazi Germany, is his political mm-hmm. rallies. Those yeah. flashbacks made it look like they were goose-stepping Nazis and he was dressed in all-black Gestapo. And what would have been way more terrifying is if it had looked like it did today, with just blue suits, the little, you know, God save the queen, you know, pin, like their version of that. Because, you know, and they couldn't predict the future, but it's always the safe way to go. Just make it look like Nazis and you can get away with anything you want. 
But if they had made it look realistic and he was just an impassioned speaker that turned mm. into the monster, the giant talking head, that would have been next level. So I do think they may have taken the easy way out with those just those flashback shots of him I mean, yelling into the mic in black leather with red banners behind him. Oh, yeah. And it's obvious. And the flag, it's it's an obvious swastika knockoff that they had. I, I think, I think mm. I'm with you. Do you know who the stunt double was that came out of the flame in the fire? Yes, I standing do. Standing there. That's a real generated. I thought that was a fucking CGI. Image. No, a real, they, uh, they actually gelled him up and he walked fuck. through the fire. Yes, and dude. Dave, Dave, ah! who, and Dave, who was it? It's Chad Stahelski. The director of John fucking Wick is that oh, guy. Oh, my God. Yeah. Chad Stahelski. That is so cool. He was so tell everybody why he's associated with the Wachowskis. Wasn't he neat? Wasn't he, wasn't he famously Keanu Reeves stuntman for years and years and years? For years. Yeah. Was he, was he for, he was, yeah. Neo? yeah. More well, importantly, he was, yeah. he was he a was stunt, the stunt coordinator. coordinator of beer fest. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was uh, he was the stunt double for Keanu Reeves in the first Matrix, and also, by the way, Wild Wild West. He was also did some stunts there. You can't forget about that. Bob Wow and fight choreographer Jim West, Jim Desperado, Jim Ruff West. West. No, no, you don't want nada. <laughs> you don't want nada. None of this. No, no. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's right. Uh, and the replacements, of We're course. Going Love straight. Yes. Sorry. But yes, that's right. Oh wow! <laughs> I didn't know he was stunt a stunt. Double. I didn't know he was a stunt coordinator for Serenity. That's that's awesome. That fight is awesome. tons of shit. Like, I mean, he was, oh, yeah. I mean, the, he, he, he was their guy. So the legend. And also, by the way, can you fucking believe that John Wick 4 did not win Best Stunt Ensemble at the SAGs? Who, who voted on this? Now, respect who to the mi- Mission Impossible 4. Respect. There are probably some great stunts in that. But Tom Cruise did his own stunts. Come on. And I know Keanu did a lot of his. So there were so many people falling down flights of fucking stairs in yeah, John Wick 4. Yeah, that stairwell fight alone. They probably How should give it up. How on earth did they not win? And then, oh, sorry, the hard thing. How on earth? And then also the, um, what is that fucking gate in Paris called? The little gate with the circle. And so, I, I can't believe John Wick 4 didn't win. But I guess they won every other year. Dave, you have a drink ticket up. You drink. The Ark? Are you talking about the Ark? The little the little one that's in Washington yeah. Square? The big one with the circle oh, drive? That scene was crazy. Yeah. Anyway. But dude, I'm glad you pointed that out, you guys, because I just assumed that was a computer graphic image. Yeah, no, he I was. I really did. I was like. They threw him in a G string, ah! covered him in fire resistant gel. They also had to, oh, lower, God, his, they had to lower his body temperature as well. Um, uh, right, like right down. And it was, it was like minus something outside when they shot it. So. Really good writing. The first time. <laughs> who is it? Who is the first kill where he says. I knew one day you'd come for me. And it's the first time you see that flashback. Oh, it's the Mm. talk show host, dude. He kills him in the shower. Yeah. Yeah. He says, I knew you'd come. That first time you see him and just the quick cut of him walking through the flames. Like it's, it is a fun reveal how they tell you what happened. And I like that what happened. This is good. We we should probably give credit to the graphic novel. I'm not sure if the Wachowskis came up with all of this plot on their own. I'm sure Sure. a lot of it was in the novel. Oh yeah. yeah. You gotta, you gotta chop it down. You gotta, you gotta figure it out. The idea that you have this parallel between the Count of Monte Cristo yeah. and this person, V, who is number five. V, you learn that too, which is great. He's a prisoner who is going under these... He's a, he's a political prisoner, basically. He's being put underneath all these laboratory tests to try to build a new superhuman kind of weapon. You know, a classic. We've all heard of that trope before. But in doing so... They succeed, and then it just gets the building explodes. And I guess you assume that he's associated with that. But this whole tale is mostly it's half his personal revenge and half political uprising, and that's interesting. I think Mm. maybe I literally just realized why they one reason why they call it V. There are these two points, and they do a good job through Natalie Portman's character of of trying to help you navigate. Is he more upset about what happened to him? or about what happened to them, the people, that what happened to him was just a product of their letting this man come to power mm. and just giving up on their democracy. Yeah. And that what happened to him was a consequence of that. Whether or not he's a man or an idea, I well, feel like what, is something I mean, that they leave, and you have to watch it a bunch of times. Because even the fact that Natalie Portman at the end kind of goes like, I'm way more interested in the man. 
And it was like, wait, this whole movie, he was trying to explain that the idea is way more important than him. And it ends yeah. with her saying, I'm more interested in the man. It kind of reminds it me. Opens I love with that, remember? Yeah. And I, I love I love in Game of Thrones when Arya's asking about who the first faceless man was. And he was like, who is, who is the first one? And he goes, he was no one. Like as a reminder being like, that's not the point. But in this case, it, it is a weird toggle that maybe if you watch more times, maybe it'll bother you sometimes and maybe not another time. But yeah, you see him put his, that, the first no, time you see him, you see him put the mask un- on and then later she leaves and takes the mask off. You never see his face, but yeah. Let's unravel that. Let's unravel that for just a second because I would imagine this movie version, again, I'm just fucking, this is total conjecture. I've never read the graphic novel. But we love a love story in movies. It helps. It helps to ground a character in romantic relationships. There's a, a, a very relatable pursuit yeah, there. Yeah, even if it's not it a opens sexual up romantic empathy. relationship, some kind of intimacy, yeah. She, she, we're joking about the Stockholm Syndrome, but she did end up being kind of like uh, exactly what I'm talking about, where this woman ends up being the decision maker for if the country was going to move forward into full anarchy by sending the train with the explosions. And yet in her action of doing that, she has a line, right? In, they very intentionally put it at the same place that I'm going to remember him. Now, I still think that because of the opening oh. to your to what you're saying, Jeff, my whole adage, they teach you how to watch the movie. They teach you what the movie is going to be. They're telling us from the beginning, we remember this man because of what he stood for. What's his name? Jeff. Fal- uh, Guy Dave. Fawkes. Fal- crack- cracker. Guy Fawkes, yeah. So cracker. we remember this man for what he stood for. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, who's that cracker? So ultimately, <laughs> and then ultimately, by the end of the film, because people who are now dead are being revealed in the crew, the man is the mask, right? The man, I will remember the man. I will remember... The act, like the action of the man. I guess that's the only way I can. I, I mean, can, the man. I don't want the, to think that it's so cheap that she just fell in love with him, and that that's why she decided to just believe in what he's been preaching the whole time because she loves him now. Or the man was the idea. But yeah, maybe. Or even just the, the he that's, walked the walk. Maybe that was mm. it too, right? Like what Bill Maher was maybe about climate change, where he was like, Greta Thunberg walks the walk. You don't. You love flying commercial. You own land, and you use plastic. So don't pretend like you're a climate warrior. All right. This guy actually walked the walk. That, so maybe that's why she. That, that and that he. God, I was thinking, you know, just listening to all the news of this crazy time we're living in. This, and I remember thinking during this movie that, are they trying to say that the man and the idea, like like you were just saying, Dave, are to a to a point are inseparable. The most successful movements seem to involve a a leader that is called upon that rises up with an idea mm. and it's both of those things well, when are you, kind when of you look at the original guy fawkes like everyone they they had a night called guy fawkes night where everyone lit like firecrackers and shit and like but no like you had to be taught what he did hmm. like the, yeah. the the rhyme was yeah. there the remember remember the fifth of November, it was all there but it wasn't really associated but everybody knew who guy fawkes was they just didn't know what he did in Australia, it was like, this guy tried to blow up Westminster Abbey, and they're like, okay, this is a holiday for us. Yeah. It was actually a British <laughs> holiday. <laughs> it's good. I guess, I guess we just like having holidays, that so gigantic we it. fucking <laughs> That beginning of that gigantic fucking John tangent, I was just trying to give it respect. A genre film ended up navigating very complicated, not oh, yeah. trite uh, political oh. discourse in a, in a very satisfying, cathartic way without seeming... Like it was just waving a flag for the left. It seemed like it did something much more than that in, in a very hmm. poetic way. I don't know. It's, well, it's, impressive. It's, it's ta- impressive. It's It toggles a fine line between Watchmen and Mouse. I mean, this, yeah, good goes. call. This dude. whole movie yeah. is the manifesto of someone who's just tired about shit. But the shit is justified in a way that <laughs> if we did it right now, if you could make this movie where somebody does this that blows it up right now. I don't think it'd be received and as well. It would only, yeah, it would only feel like it's a very radical perspective. Of course, blowing up, in, you know, that's a radical perspective no matter mm. what. But they raise the stakes so high on what the chancellor is yeah. and what he represents that they can kind of get away with you know, say, what, yeah, whatever they like, want, which is destroying. It's like the same, it. yeah. like it's Watchmen. It's an alternate reality thing, and I think it it works because of that because you've got that dis, like just that little bit of distance there, so you don't. You don't draw too many parallels to our own life, 
because it's an alternate reality. It's set in an alternate reality, so they can push the envelope a little bit further. And I, I but You're the totally message right, still dude. comes across. Watchmen was really successful. I, I think one of my favorite. I mean, the movie wasn't. I'd the forgotten book was. that this. Oh come on! Nah. The movie's good. I like the, the movie. The movie's great. I love it, but it was not successful. The director's cut of that movie is is awesome. That is probably my favorite movie he's ever made. Is the director's cut of that movie? Anyway, uh, the quick cuts on the night of. So in the last sequence, when it is the final day, it is the fifth of December, November, a year later. So. When you start seeing the cuts of the bar, the house, and one other place where you realize nobody's home, mm-hmm. that's fun. I, there's yeah, just I enough sat up time. in my chair and went, oh, fuck, because I forgot about that bit. I forgot. I mean, yeah. too, I forgot it, too, because <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. just enough time between that and when you see the you know, the plethora of deliveries yeah. to everybody's home of these. But you don't you know realize those boxes. you're seeing those people the whole way through the movie. Like, they, they yeah. repeat well, that sequence. I realized it and I was like, God, this is fucking movie at its best. They keep showing us the exact same, like three sets. And I feel like I'm watching all of England. There's a bar, there's a family. And there's one, there's one other that they cut to. It's an, it's not another family home, but it's another, you know, cliche. Look at this representation of regular people in Mm. that society. But I mean, it was just so effective. I don't know if that was in the editing or in the script, but it was really, really exciting when they finally show the people of London walking around in that mask. It was fucking cathartic. Yeah. And this, again, folks, this is, yes, it's post, it's post Helm's Deep. It's post, so there was some crowd CGI technology that could have been used. I don't think they used it for this one. I think I read that they, that there was a lot of, at least in the initial sequences where they show them walking, not that final wide shot where you see mm-hmm. them all on the bridge. But the initial sequences when they're approaching the squares, those were fucking extras. Well, apparently the br- when they awesome. were shooting on the bridge, they could only shut that down for four minutes at a time. So they had to shut That's it down. Awful. And it was only be- only, between- only between midnight. No, it was midnight and 4.30 in the morning. It was the only time they could only shut it. Four minutes? They could I think shut it 28 down for days four- later got it for like 20 minutes. Yeah, they, I think they, they were. <laughs> yeah, it was ridiculously short. So they had to run out, do the take, get out, get the fuck out of the way. Guys, what get the fuck? The Why do you think that James McTeague didn't, you have the career that he probably deserved after this. I don't. I don't know. Mm. What What did he make after this? I'm trying to. I, I looked it up before and I already forget. He, he made. He a, made the Raven, which the, was in okay. 2012 with a uh, John. Uh, not John. Uh, what's his name? Ninja Assassin as well. Um, what's his name, you guys? Uh, fucking um, say anything. Oh, Cusack. Cusack? Cusack. Oh, yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. I get, he's inspired he just by. Just didn't really explode. Yeah. Oh. So anyway, I just, I don't know what happened there, but that, I was just, man, that would break my heart if Wait, I made we, a movie watched, this cool and we this watched, good, and I didn't He directed just, some episodes of Marco Polo, which isn't the same thing, but um, we watched a couple fucking, episodes of that. I liked that a lot. And Dave, I've been waiting to say this because I, I said this before the show, and I said I would wait and, <laughs> and share this uh, on, on the episode just so you could be a part of this. Adrian Biddle is the cinematographer. This man was a cinematographer for most Ridley Scott films, starting with uh, Aliens. So that's not Ridley's, but he was a producer credit on it. But he ended up doing uh, Thelma and Louise, um, a bunch of uh, Event Horizon, The Mummy, The World Is Not Enough, uh, all, The Mummy Returns, all the way up to I love that he's, Vendetta. I love that he's shot the two movies that I can't remember what happens in the middle of or at the end of. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> but then it looks like he passed away in 2005. This was his last movie. I didn't know this that. This guy, I guess, was... I don't know what happened to him. He died in London on December 7th. I mean, from the sound of it, he fucking worked himself to death. He fucking... But what a way to go. That's how I'm going Bride. out. <laughs> oh, he shot The Prince's Bride. Fuck, he shot Willow. Oh, nice. Fucking, Holy yeah. shit. He's, he's a, anyway, yeah. I, just, I just wanted to call some... Uh, call some some attention to that he guy. He was pretty he old, some, though, was my he? favorite movies growing up. Sorry? He was pretty old by that point, though, wasn't he? He like, was born in 52. Wow. Okay, so not old. Not so old. Yeah. Yeah, not old enough. So I, I hope, mean, anyone I don't know who worked sick, in the film industry in the 70s, though. How cool is that? I'm just saying, this guy, if he did go out, I don't know what happened to him, but Adrian, if you did go out, if you were sick or if you were hit by, I don't know what happened, brother, but the last thing you put on <laughs> film... 
The last thing this London man put on film, this British dude, was the fucking parliament exploding <laughs> to the 1812 overture. That's, that's kind of bad. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, fucking yeah, that's badass. That's, uh, going, yeah. Our work here is done. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Anyway, what do you, what, anything else would you guys think? I love this. Oh, I love talked about him. Go ahead. Stephen Fry? Hugo. Oh, Hugo's so good. Well, we yeah, all, they're all, Stephen Fry's scenes, it's, he's unbelievable. Daddy D. Stephen Fry's. It's fucking perfect, dude. Stephen Ray is Stephen fucking Ray's perfect. Per- I love the doubt. You could see it all over his face, but it's believable that he could get away with it too. Like you can mm. see in his face, you're like, he's questioning this kind of stuff, but you could also see like nobody would ever question him. You know, he just seems like he's doing his job. Like, I don't know. He, I thought Stephen yeah. Ray was great. Um, he's unbelievable. H- Hugo's, ben Hugo's, Miles. Hugo's, yeah. Um, we saw Ben Miles in, uh, in um, The Crown. Uh, no, well, yes, in the Crown, yes, but we saw him in Wolf Hall. He was the lead of Wolf Hall, which is an oh, RSC Jesus, production dude. that came yeah. to America, and he was um, the the Jeff. I totally forgot. That he was he the Mark was the, the Mark Rylance role on the TV show. He was on stage. He was like King Henry the Eighth's, yeah, I vizier, think, yeah, yeah, whatever counselor, whatever. Fucking mm. brilliant, absolutely great. But let's give it up for Mr. Hugo. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. Holy hell, dude. Yes, there may have been, there were inevitably a lot of performances were done in a voice booth, you know, with it's a lot of this is going to be ADR for sure. Oh, the, with the whole thing, every, every single piece of it was ADR. But my God, like, I'm sure some of that was him wearing the mask too, if it wasn't the other guy for some of it. The the acting, I, Dave, I wanted to talk with you about this. I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah, bring that up earlier. So most of- Most of it was him. They're just wondering if Most some of, of the scenes. Was probably yeah. him for sure. well, I'm sure he he at least had the uh, the sound from set maybe as a reference. That would be really kind of his, you know, on his for sound sure. recordist to be like, here is the way, the inflection, the rhythm that you set it on set. But then again, with editing and stuff, who knows if you actually need that? But I mean, he might just be that good. He can he remembers and can duplicate the performance. This was. I just I just wanted to mention and Dave jump in here if you felt this as well. Uh. Sorry. It's not that there were not wide shots or medium shots. There were. But because this lead character wore a cape, a pilgrim hat, and a mask, (laughs) and a long wig, most of his coverage was in close-up, which dictated that a lot of her coverage and whoever he was in a scene with was in close-up. And I just thought that they somehow managed... To it, obviously, that helped insulate the world. It made me feel yeah. kind of trapped with them, but it also didn't feel. Um, it didn't feel that the close up was inconsequential. Whereas a lot mm. of times, most people, who, you know, people who aren't filmmakers, we tend to like kind of save the close up for like a really important moment when you need to kind of get inside a character's head. And this one, because of the nature of it, I'm sure they did in their screen test. They were like, it just it just looks too silly if we sit on wide shots too long. This yeah. guy's just in this fucking all black and a long hair wig. It's so silly, but it looks incredible in a close up. Mm-hmm. But then also, it'd be too weird imagine that performance, to cut away though, Natalie and wi- mediums. Where he's just using, all he's, all he's got to play with is his shoulders and head tilt. Mm-hmm. He nails he did, it. He did, dude. It, it it really it was it was fantastic and also so on, a, fantastic. on a screen like on a twenty foot high screen or a thirty foot high screen, that's going to be like off putting as fuck. That mask full frame, full frame, dude. Yeah. And dude, they pulled yeah. it off so well that again, I would imagine they this may have been in a script, this may have been storyboarded, but they they justified it and it worked. A profile extreme close up of Natalie's lips touching the lips of a mask in a kiss. Very interesting. It was just like, that could have been silly as hell if they had not justified it and made us actually yeah. feel some kind of some kind of thing between them. So like when you can pull that off and you can make us feel that we're not supposed to laugh at that or kind of think like, is this for real? Or am I yeah. am I allowed to laugh at it? They probably thought a lot about I just, it. I thought they did a great job. So I, I congratulations also, to them. I love that the, uh, the, the, I love the drugs guy. They're like, he's the richest man there, drugs. The legal ones. I love that. That he yeah. the legal ones. Um, I yeah. also I also loved. Um, well, this was well. I, there's a lot of things I loved. I love the CDs. I love that Stephen Fry's name was Daddy D, as I said before. I love that the fireworks look <laughs> fake as fuck, and it was fine. I love that Evie's name stands for electric vehicle nowadays. Um, and I also <laughs> love that. <laughs> I love. What's very curious to me is. Uh, 
that this they literally have a quote in here actually two things i love an oppenheimer shout out they literally like yep. hey oppenheimer and it's like hey this is a good time for us to watch this movie and talk about it on the podcast i also love that i forgot to mention that alan moore wrote the graphic novel i mentioned the illustrator not alan moore who also wrote some batman graphic novels but okay the last Ooh, thing i yeah, love yeah. is this movie did come out in 2005 we're still reeling from 9 11 and there's a line that says who says that blowing up a building can change the world that's true, dude. Wow. I, w- I wonder yeah. I wonder how close that is to the graphic novel. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they tried to blow up Parliament in it, of course. I wonder what if it, it was inspired by I, I I just I wonder do they know anything about the Patriot Act when they were writing when they were adapting the screenplay? Like the timing of it, even though again four I, years. I think you'll find most of this stuff was already in it. Yeah. Like, when was the graphic yeah. novel published? Do you know? That I don't do know. Right I have I have it right here too. It's a 88, 89. So somewhere wow. 88 to 89. Oh, yeah, wow. in the 80s. We, this is how we too, thought that... it was going to end up. Jeff, I have going off of what you were just idea. saying, they refer in this movie to the U.S. war. The kept, we were yeah, the two US years war, yeah. into our gigantic war in the Middle East, yep. unraveling yep. everything mm. that you know happened there. So there was a lot going into watching this. I was in my... This, what was this? I was in my second or third year of college. They were, and, little, dude, I they were was a little ahead of themselves, though, because they were referring to the U.S. <laughs> Civil War. Uh-huh. Oh, the, were they? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know it was a Civil Wait, War. Wait, are you yeah. sure, I Dave? It was just yeah. a, I just thought it was a war. I thought they had no, just... No, the this, one is, point this is after the Nazis. This is after the Nazis. At one point, there's a reference to the U.S. Civil War. Okay, but I think when they said the U.S. Uh, mm. I don't know. Uh, okay. All right. I can't. I can't go. Back. I just assumed it was another world war that the U.S. had like pulled everybody into, and I, I thought it was. Either way, either way, there was. Yeah, to your point, there was a lot of us and our culture going into this, so the risk of them releasing this was even higher. Which mm-hmm. is why, objectively, I feel like those all those arguments I were making still stand. Subjectively, to come out in two thousand five, four years after nine eleven, two years after the start of the Iraq War, nuts. Yeah, pretty fucking crazy it's, that they went all in. Considering after the um, the tube attacks in London, it became yeah. one of the most yeah. surveilled cities. Like their reaction was to become one of the most surveilled cities in the world. Yeah, and it just put cameras yeah. everywhere. Sure, so, man, dude. I'm I'm pretty good sure times. America might CCTV. have been an afterthought. <laughs> CCTV, not good times. London rail attacks, good times. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> for vendetta for yeah, coming up. Yeah. yeah. I will tell you, it was Christ, one one line that got me real hard. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> and it's when he's he goes to like, see the aroused or <laughs> sorry, <laughs> not really. No, um, <laughs> that was good. That was good. Um, <laughs> when he's sitting there talking to the woman, uh, just before when he breaks into a house oh, and yeah. she's telling him the oh, story, yeah. and then he's Today like, he "So you're yeah. gonna kill me now?" And just with absolute yeah. caring in his voice, he said, I killed you 10 minutes ago Yeah, while you were sleeping. Well, then, of course, you rewatch it. Is it too, it late? Like, <gasps> Is it too late for an apology? Never. Never. But it's like, yeah, yeah. will it hurt? Yeah. And he's like, no. And she's like, she thanks him. I was like, yeah. Well, she says at first when he, she comes in, she says, you've come to kill me. He says yes, and she says thank God. In fact, at thank first, I, at yeah. first, I thought I, I don't know what I, I couldn't tell, so I like put the subtitles on and blasted the sound, and I went back. I, I thought she, I thought maybe she said oh God or thank whatever, and thank you, and she says you've come to kill me. Yes, thank God. So it's almost like she couldn't live with the guilt anyway. It was just, it yeah. was the whole scene was really great. That was a really, really well done scene. Yep. Yeah, that was a beautiful scene. I just, I did have Scarlet a little trouble roses. though getting past the finger men. Because of the name? Yeah, there was a lot of juvenile snickering on my couch while we were watching this movie. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finger men. I, I, love the li- I love the line. Too. We are being buried beneath the avalanche of your inadequacies, Mr. Creedy. <laughs> that's a solid burn. God, the lines. That's a yeah. solid that's a burn. Solid, that's such a British burn. <laughs> and he's like, sorry, sorry, sir. <laughs> like, what else can you say? What else yeah. can you say to that? Incidents of positive responses from like basically it sounds like Twitter. It sounds like they were on Twitter. These first speech when he hijacks the the television station, mm. that was pretty remarkable. Simple. Yes. Yeah, a lot of alliteration. Yeah, very stylized, but so well thought out. It was just yeah. pretty remarkable writing. Like mm. Dave, you're right. It is a dialogue heavy thing, and 
you know, obviously this this worked because of its style, but we tend to cringe at like that kind of uh, verboseness, that kind of uh, hody toady verboseness, yeah, verboseness <laughs> with, with dialogue. And yet somehow like it it starts in that place. And I think that V, the character and the writing, like they on purpose, like try to do that to get your attention. Mm. And yet I was just I was just so impressed with the, the tracking, the the points that he made. Yeah, it was never re- repetitive. It's it's like funny because it you, you, really you, you find yourself leaning in because everything he says becomes a, a treat, almost. Quite a manifesto. Quite, quite a, a manifesto. Quite a manifesto. It was pretty crazy. Awesome. All right, guys. Uh, yeah. Anything good. else? I think uh, I, think I think, we're kind of finding our logical conclusion. Yeah. De- here. Definitely watch this movie if you haven't already. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, worth it's worth a rewatch. Yeah. I have two more funny lines. You, my fat metal friends, when he's beaten and he's like sword yeah, fighting yes. you, like guys. And then I, I also <laughs> yeah. love um, uh, the Eggy in a Basket. Eggy in the Basket. Mm. Like the day that he's basically going to get like murdered before that TV show. It's like yep. Eggy in the Basket. Mom used to make them. I was like, I bet you Dave's had many Eggy in the Baskets before. All right. <laughs> no, never. Actually. I made those a lot. It's, I call it's... them Egg in a Nest, but uh, I, I, I one I more point I want to bring up rap. though that um they keep cutting back to state like the state media, be it sure. in the background or this happening, this happening. Yeah, that's that sounds um, more Russian than British. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like it's it's like a constant tabloid narrative from like a posty pommy Tucker Carlson going on there. Yeah. Uh, who gets killed off very early, thankfully. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> the narrative that they're putting out compo- like compared to what we've just seen happen on screen. It's funny, yeah. It makes me mad. Is is almost laughable, except it just hit a little too close to home. I know, I know. In this modern age, yeah. And especially, you love all the people who like blatantly saw it. Yeah, and oh, everyone's the sitting there looking at the TV, going, "Yeah, they're full of shit," but that's all they do. Pretty good, man. All right, pretty fucking well, good. I guess that's it. Right before we get into our final segment, what you've been watching, we're gonna spin the wheel for next week. And gentlemen, I hope it's another uh, stimulating conversation, just like this week's, right here. But Dave, mm. you ready to bring this to a close here? This here segment with a spinning of the wheel. Let's spin that wheel. Fuck yeah! All right, we got. Oh, it's a one. It's a nine. It's a na- six. <laughs> yes. Nineteen sixty nine. Yes. We're 69 and next week. 1969. Yes. We're not going to sit here and Google <laughs> We're gonna all the things that But we will tell you at the end of our episode what we are going to watch for next week and how you can watch it along with us. But for now, we're going to finish up this here segment with what you've been watching, where we tell you what we've been watching, give you our recommendations of the week. Dave, we always start with you. What have you been watching besides some shows at the 92nd Street Y, which I hear are really good? <laughs> they are. Um... I have, did I did I say last week I watched Killer finally? No, no. Yeah, I, uh, I, Fincher? I, I did Fincher's Killer. Yeah, I watched Fincher's Killer. Cool. And? Um, it took me a minute to fall into it, but it got me. Um, yeah. Again, a lot of, another one with a constant narrative running the way through it, like a stream of consciousness narrative almost running through it. Um, which is ironic nice. considering this one does too. Um, and I you... watched and I watched Past Lives because I was trying to catch up with as many Oscar films as I can. And what do you think of Past Lives? Yeah. All right, Dave. Come on. No, it was oh, it was it was, it was okay. It was just yeah. Okay. okay, come on, Dave. Did you agree with what I said about the killer? That it's um, it's like one of the most subjective David Fincher movies because there's no B plot. It never cuts yeah, away from him ever. No. It just stays with them like the whole way. It's kind of, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. Someone's phone's um, ringing. Someone's, yeah, someone's that's, phone no, that's my ringing. doorbell. Someone's ringing my doorbell. Oh, He's busy. What delivery did you get? Yeah, I don't know. I'll find out in a minute. Was it your flashlight? Hopefully it's um, not so finger men. We have. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> John, what did you watch this week? I watched. All of this season of True Detective Night Country. Oh my God. Oh, I, I want it at the Globes was, or at the Sags. I was like, ah, oh, fuck, I should have watched it. Yeah. So, Callie Reese and Jodie Foster. I think I did say I started it last weekend because remember, I was mm. trying to. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> man, it is, it is. I like that show a lot. It's hard to, you know, completely satisfy everybody when you're doing a wrap up, you know, of a giant mystery. I was, I was certainly satisfied enough, but. 
the journey getting there is uh, is awesome. And there are so many reasons why I, I found it. I don't know. I was really engaged by it. It looked like they really shot in an icy climate. I don't know if they did, but it looked like they did. I bought it. Just the, the terrain, the weather, what it did to them was so intense. The acting is is so good. It's so good throughout. I was just so impressed. And I, I don't know, man, it just felt like a secondary world almost. It's just trapped up there in Ennis, Alaska. It was really unique. It, it was really, really cool. I, I loved it. Uh, yeah. How about you? Where, where is it set? Alaska? Ennis, Alaska. That's what you said. I, was, I had my question yeah. in mind before you said that at the very end there. Um, so Angela and I finished one day on Netflix. I, I think we were, both a, oh, yeah. we were both a little split on the, 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 the... I'll say this. The writers make a writing choice which can be very emotionally pulling. And it can also kind of be like, eh, the writers didn't have to do that depending on how you watch shows. I obviously watch shows as the latter, but no matter what, it was very moving. It was very moving. It kind of reminded me like oh, of if, if, if normal people, which is probably the stylistic comp for it, but it was more like when Harry met Sally, where it's like- Kind of Jim Brooksy. Kind of James yeah, Brooksy yeah, 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 kind exactly, of style. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But 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 so but contemporary and the soundtrack, the way that the music really informs these contemporary uh-huh. tensions, um, it was very normal people. So I really loved um one day. And you know, there's there's some there's always cliches in rom coms, you know. Um here's looking at you, kid. Mm-hmm. Or um, sure, they, yeah. they called me Mr. Glass or something, but <laughs> uh in this <laughs> You know, I I feel like they it was just really great. They called really me wonderful. Mr. Glass. Um, and then of course Drive to Survive came out, season six, getting ready the uh, uh, Bahrain Grand Prix oh, next week. So excited! And I just was like, Angela, let's watch one episode. You know, I really like it. Let's just watch one. I like the adrenaline. Five episodes. We watched five episodes in two days. <laughs> that Portlandia. It's so good. Oh, that Portlandia yeah. ep- uh, sketch where they sit down, they're like, I don't know, let's turn on Battlestar. I heard Battlestar Galactica is, is worth. Oh, and it's yes. like three weeks later. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They have beards and they've quit their jobs. Oh my god, yeah. Um I wanted to throw in there oh did that, you have another that, one? That's it. Those are the ones. I also did uh I haven't watched this Friday's episode of Masters of the Air, but I can't wait to watch it. But I did keep going after last week and I'm gonna keep pushing it out there because I don't think enough people are watching it. The new look. That thing with Ben Mendelssohn like and it? Julia Binoche. Mm. I am yeah, dude. I'm liking it. And it's I I yeah, I, yeah, I don't even want to say anything about it. Just just give it a shot, folks. It's on Apple TV Plus if you it. have it. I will, give it a shot. I will it's say, like four episodes, five episodes in. Um, now. One thing we delved into, which some people might be interested in hearing, is uh, the live action Avatar The Last Airbender. Yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. People um, are talking about it. Yeah. And like, my wife is a huge, like, she's watched that thing from top to tail. My wife. Yeah. Um, <laughs> three times tail. at least. And Damn. she just Jeez, sat Chris. back and she just enjoyed the <laughs> shit out of that episode. Like we're, we're one episode oh, in, we're going to keep going. Um, right. But yeah, it's it's a pretty good adaptation. I, I, th- I still think it. I like One Piece better, but this is a pretty good ap- adaptation. Nice. It's certainly right. better than M. Night Shyamalan. All right, people. Oh, let's pick a movie. <laughs> we're going to cut for, for three seconds, play some Dasein, and then we're going to come. Are we, do we do Dasein? Who cares? Dasein's yeah, great. Go look yeah, And then, okay, cool. And then we're going to tell you what we're watching next week and how to watch it with us to 1969. See you in a second. And we're back. And we're back. <laughs> Let's I'm land not. this plane. 1969. A lot of great movies. So many westerns. A couple kids it's, movies. There was not a lot of great movies. Dave. We're not gonna do Easy Rider. We're not gonna do. We're not gonna make the obvious choice. Instead, we're gonna do. You ready? Midnight Cowboy. Woo! I've never seen it. I'm walking here. <laughs> Going to film school. Going to film school. That you can watch on Paramount. Nope, you can't. That one you have to watch on Tubi. Or you can watch on Paramount Plus. It's on Paramount Plus. Canopy. Oh, wait. Midnight Cowboy? Canopy. Midnight Cowboy is not on Paramount Plus. Tubi or Pluto, yeah. Tubi or Pluto, people. Tubi, Pluto, Canopy. If your school is lucky, my school does not have this movie. Fuck my school. See you next week to talk about the film year 1969 and Midnight Cowboy starring John Voight and Dustin Hoffman in his first major role after The Graduate. Can't wait to talk about it. See you, knuckleheads. See you.